E-T-E, Imhotep, Sunni, Sinet, Ankwas, the Jed, Ankuja, Sinet. Dua, 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 Hindu for listening. Life, strength, and health to the family. Brothers and sisters. It's your brother, Asaram Ka. As we continue the series, we're going to finish the book, you know. So it's going to, I told you, the series is going to be nice, long, drawn out for you. Something you can always come back and play in sections, portions. So you can break stuff down, right? So you can break it down. Last time we left off on section D. So today we're going to read section D before we start getting into the lessons and remember we're just in the introduction stages um shortly we'll be into the lessons of the book and we'll be covering the lessons so it will be a method for you to pick up on the metal nature understand what's going on you can always ask questions after i read each page just so you know um i'll stick to this a little more uh once once i read the page i'm going to come back over here to the stream yard and i'm going to look if you're commenting i'll be able to answer your questions if you have questions if you don't no biggie because it'll be here let me get rid of that one and let us begin because we got a lot of reading to do today huh section d episode five Sir Alan Gardner's uh, Egyptian grammar. We're reading the book all the way through. So, a brief survey of Egyptian literature, point 12. Throughout the entire course of history, no people has been more afflicted with the scribendi, uh, Cacotheus, than the Egyptians. The decorative uh, character of the hieroglyphic script and its close connection with pictorial art made it a natural and handy medium of ornamentation. Hence, in temple and tomb, there is hardly a wall but bears hieroglyphic inscriptions. And even the common objects of daily life, such as toilet utensils, boxes, jewels, and weapons, often display the names and titles of their owners, or the cartouche of the pharaoh under whom they were made. It would be tedious to enumerate all the types of inscription that have come down to us, but this introduction may fitly include some account of those texts from which our knowledge of Egyptian grammar and literary style is derived. We shall confine our attention to the earlier periods and only the more important documents will be mentioned. There's a note here after mention it says the bibliographical reference and the footnotes give only the best or the most easily accessible editions. Invaluable for inscriptions still in situ in Egypt is the topographical bibliography of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic texts, reliefs, and paintings by B. Porter and R. L. B. Moss. Six volumes of it in uh, Oxford, 1927 through 39. And as I always suggest, when you hear me read one of these, go PDF the book, go try to dig it up, uh, go try to gather that book, right? A comprehensive guide to Egyptological books and articles down to 1941 is provided by Ida A. Pratt, Ancient Egypt, Sources of Information in the New York Public Library, two volumes, New York, 1925 and 1942. So that is a book you definitely probably want to read and grab, right? Because it's got the sources for the information. And there are two volumes of it. Let's go further. Uh, the religious literature. The oldest body of religious texts is the large collection of spells known as the pyramid text. You may want to write that down. Very important point. Since the most ancient and complete versions were discovered on the walls of chambers inside the pyramids of five kings of the fifth and sixth dynasties, these texts, for the most part of very great antiquity, are exclusively concerned with the welfare of the dead king. They consist of incantations whereby his place in the sky and the other prerogatives of a dead king are assured to him. And they also incorporate the ritual which was recited in connection. Very important. Um, let's read the two footnotes. Huh? A considerable collection of translations into German will be found in G. Roder, 
or condemn their religion that's Alton Egyptian and religious stemming their Walter Herasgeben von Walter Otto uh, Jenna 1915 Kurt Seth the well it says die but it's the right uh Al Egyptian the Egyptian pyramid text that's how you would say it in German four volumes Leipzig 1908 through 22 uh, posthumously a handy though not wholly reliable vocabulary in L spellers less text des pyramids Egyptianes volume 2 Brussels 1924 let me check y'all y'all good y'all good y'all all right let's go to let's go below page 19 Daily offerings made in the pyramid temples. At a later date, these texts were usurped for their own benefit by the nobles, and many excerpts are found written in the interiors of the large wooden coffins of Dynasty 9 and di through Dynasty 11. The coffins just mentioned also contain an important collection of spells, which are known specifically as the coffin text. Write that down. Let's check the footnote on that real quick. Standard edition, still complete, Adrian DeBuck, the Egyptian coffin text in the University of Chicago Oriental Institute publications in three volumes. Uh, Chicago, 1935 through 47 is around the time he finished it. Uh, P. Lacau, Sarcophagus Anteriors, Al Navel, Empire, two volumes, Cairo, 1904 through 6. In catalog general des antiquities egyptian as du muse du Kari in cairo basically um the antiquities p lacal text religious egyptian so egyptian religious text recul de Treval, volumes 26 to 34 also separately in paris <clears throat> these are french books Besides other publications of less importance, the kind of writing employed for these texts may be seen in S. Birch, Egyptian text of the earliest period from the coffin of Amamu in the British Museum, London, 1886. Um, let's go, let's go back to what to, to the reading right here. Other texts from the same source and of precisely the same nature constitute the nucleus and the earliest recension of a collection of texts to which Egyptologists have given the misleading name of the Book of the Dead. This is not really a book at all, but a heterogeneous assemblage of funerary spells of various dates, including also a few hymns to Ra and Osar, selections from which we were written on which were written on papyrus and deposited in the tombs of the most well-to-do. So anybody who had that money would usually pay to get these done in their, their burial home, right? Their, their tomb. Egyptians write down to the Roman period the number of spells wrongly called chapters contained in an individual copy, contained in individual copies, and the order in which they occur vary greatly. The most complete Books are coming forth by their Book of the Dead, or several other names we have for it, the Peret M. Henry, blah, 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 blah. Uh, there's a lot of names, right, to, to call this by, and there's uh, a few in particular that are distinguishable names, which we won't say right here. Belong to the Ptolemaic period and count upwards of 150 spells, often embellished with figments. Fine specimens of rather less extent imminent from the tombs of the uh, dignitaries of dynasty 18 through 19. These are often admirably written and, sump and sumptuously illustrated in color. It is thus convenient to distinguish three versions of the Book of the Dead. Write that down. Three versions. One from the Middle Kingdom version, principally found on the early coffins. Two, the New Kingdom version, consisting of papyri dating from the 18th to the 20th dynasties. And three, the versions of the late period, from Dynasty 21 onwards. Let's check out the notes on those, huh? all these footnotes. Being gradually incorporated into the work by D. Buck, cited in NR. The chief works mostly in need of completion and revision are E. Naval Das Egyptian, thought of blah, 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 blah. Uh, Dynasties 18 through 20, 
three volumes, Berlin, 1886. E.A. Wallace Budge, uh, The Book of the Dead, The Chapters Are Coming Forth by Day, three volumes, London, 1898. A, late, a later, rather fuller re edition in 1910. The British Museum, 1899. E. Naville, The Funerary, Funeral Papyrus of Ayu, Ayuya. Um, Yuya and Ayuya. Yuya and Tuya. London, 1908. E. Chaparelli, E. Chaparelli, pardon me. Um, Relation sui lavori della mission in Egitto, whatever the mission was in, yeah, Torah, 1927, volume 2, pages 33 through 63. The Papyrus of Ka, Papyrus of the Spirits. Catalog of Egyptian Religious Papyri in the British Museum. Part one by A. W. Shorter, London, 1938. And the fourth footnote, the most famous of all is R. Lepschwitz, that's Tottenbauch, der Egypter Leipzig. That's the Tottenbauch. Um let's go back to our reading. I believe we were here. Earlier coffin. No, we finished these three versions from Dynasty 21. Right. So other religious books, many of them very ancient, have survived only in copies of Dynasty 19 and even later. Such are the ritual of the divine cult. The spells accompanying the daily service performed in the temples of the of the gods, the most complete copies of which are found in the temple of Sethos the first at Abydos, Seti the first. Or rather more limited extent is the ritual of the funerary cult. Oh me, that's finishing the trunk. The vignettes and texts of which are found in the tombs of many Theban nobles, the tombs of the kings at Thebes bring to our knowledge four theological works of high importance. The book of what is in the netherworld, often called the Amduat, describing the strange regions and inhabitants visited by the sun god during his nocturnal journey underground from west to east. The book of gates and the book of caverns, two other treaties dealing with topography of the netherworld and the so-called litany of the sun. Of exceptional interest, though very corrupt, is an old magical text of which the most complete copies are found in the tombs of Sethos I and Ramses III. Uh, recounting the destruction of mankind by Ra, the sun god, and the establishment in the heavens of the celestial cow goddess. Second is hymns to the gods are found not only in the Book of the Dead and on sepulchral stella of grave or gravestones, but also elsewhere. Some curious hymns to the snake goddess who were identified with the crowns of the pharaoh have been published by Ehrman from a papyrus of dynasty 17, through 18. Formerly in the possession of M. Golaneshev, uh, still early was a hymn to the crocodile god Sobek, Greek Sukos, Sukos, discovered in a tomb beneath the Ramesseum. A hymn to the Nile is ancient, but very corrupt. The hymns to Amir Ra on Papyri in Cairo and Leiden are of, we'll get to those in a second, let's read the footnotes. It says, definitive copies of the scenes and text in A.M. Calvary Calverly and M.F. Broom, The Temple of King Sethos I at Abydos, Volumes 1 and 2, London, Egypt Exploration Society and Chicago, University of Chicago Press. Did you get those in Chicago? Laricio de Cult, Divine Journalier in Egypt. So it's the ritual of the cult of the divine journey in Egypt, Paris 1902. N.D.G. Davies, The Tomb of Rekhmi Ra at Thebes, New York, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Other versions you'll find in E. Sheparelli, uh, Il Libro de Funerali degli Anti Igizani, three volumes in Turin, which is basically the funeral ritual. Third footnote, earliest examples, P. Butcher, less text as Tombs de Jehutimus III, at the Amenophis the second volume one and memoirs the El Institut Francis the Archaeology Oriental Cairo 1932 versions from later tombs E Le Fabrique that's uh Hippogis Royale de Thieves so you're talking about the 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 hypogees and the royal uh 
and, and thieves, the royals of thieves, basically. And Paris 1886 through 9, being Annals du Musée Goumet, volumes 9 and 16. All those, those are in French. So if you don't, if you don't speak French, like some of them, like I speak nine languages, right? Ça passe, enchanté, comment allez-vous ce soir, all that, right? So if you don't speak French, what you do is you get a book like that. You get it where the text is printable, and then you take it to, to, to Google Translate. French and English and some of the, the better known languages, they're going to give you a direct translation into English pretty good. You'll be able to read it that way because you probably don't speak French or German. T.H. Mastre and APN Kof Le Devre de Porte, Volume 1, and Memoir de l'Institut Francois de Orgeological Oriental in Cairo, 1939 46. So, Memoirs in the Institute of France. Of the oriental archaeologists still sitting in Cairo. A. Piankov, Le Livre de Corets, extracted from Bulletin de l'Institut Francois de Archaeological Oriental. Once again, the Oriental Institute of France with their bulletin from that institute. So is the next one. So is the next one. <laughs> And you'll notice when you see us go through the JEA, which we covered before in previous videos, watch the videos before this one. You see, we go over there and when we're reading it, most of it is translated into French. What we read is the Medunetra part. And that sometimes I can read the French part. Um, if you've ever heard me and my brother Shaku, Shaka and Dugu Kemet, who's in France, or me and my brother Kalam, who's in France, uh, they're in Paris and sometimes we'll speak French. You know, with these short sentences to each other. So, either contact some of those brothers, or like I said, Google Translate. Get a PDF form where it's printable. You can copy the text, bring it over, and you can translate the book yourself into Google Translate and understand what it's saying. Simple. Last one. G. Maspero Hem Oh Now Cairo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Same place. Same place. The Etude de l'Institut Francois de Archaeological Oriental. Same place. They have a damaged duplicate text with numerous divergences in P. Chester Beatty. Five. Chester Beatty Papyrus is what they're talking about. The fifth one. RT. One. 12 through 5. And 5. Published in A. H. Gardner. Hieratic Papyri in the British Museum. Alan H. Gardner, the person we're reading right now. Third series. London, 35. An early dynastic, what is this, 18th? Copy of the opening line is on an unpublished writing board now, the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. So you know where to get these. You know what it is. Still doing good over here. Give me just a moment. I'm going to place you on hold for a brief moment. young adults have entered the building <laughs> here we go so later date the latter indeed belongs to the borderline of the period covered by this book as do also wonderful hymns to the island or solar disc described in the tombs of El Amarna and inscribed by the hieratic king Akhenaten about 1373 to 1357 BC the stella which all the larger collections of Egyptian antiquity antiquities possesses in hundreds must here be mentioned some record merely the names titles of their dead owner and his relatives but more frequently 
a stereotype formula gives expression to his desire for funerary offerings. And this formula is often expanded in an interesting way with adjurations to passers-by to recite the requisite words of which enumerations of the benefits hope for the life after death. Scraps of autobiography or self adultery phrases are not infrequently appended. Sometimes, as already noted, hymns to the gods take the place of the more usual text. The magical papyri in Turin, Leiden, and other collections are mostly later than the 18th dynasty, though many of them doubtless represent much older archetypes. One collection of magical spells falls, however, well within our period. Let's check out our footnotes here. We may not read that whole footnote. That's a long footnote about nothing. It's going to tell you books to get, and you can see already. <laughs> it's going to tell you what information this is information from. So, A. Mariette, Les Papyrus, Egyptian, De Musée, De Boulak, Cairo, is another one. Zitzfrit, Fur, Egyptus, Brach, as German. In De G. Davies, The Rock Tombs of El Amarna, especially Volumes 4 and 6, an archaeological survey of Egypt, published by the Egypt Exploration Society, London, 1903 and 8, mainly excerpted thence in a convenient single volume, M. Sandman, text from the time of Akhenaten, Bibliotheca Egyptica 8, Brussels, 1938, Germany, see? The principal publications are as follows. These are the principal publications. So you, you want these. We just don't want to read all these. H.O. Lang and H. Schaefer. Grab on Thankstein des Mittelring Rights in Catalog General du Musée du Cairo. Four volumes, Cairo. Hieroglyphic text from the Egyptian Stella, London, British Museum, eight parts, London. Paris Pipere. Resiole the inscriptions in the dates to Musée Egyptian du Levre in the Lever Museum, basically, and the inscriptions from the rocks, right? Um, two parts Paris, A. Gayette, A. Moret, Catalogue du Musée Goumet, Gallery Egyptian. And you can just read through these. See, one is in Brussels. Keep it on the screen a bit. Egyptian tomb stellas and offering stones, the stella of many other museums in Italy, Russia, have likewise been published, but it has been necessary to confine this note to publications of primary importance. Two valuable works not restricted to any single collection are D. Dunham, Naga et der Stella of the First Intermediate Period, Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and J. J. Cleary and J. Van Dier text, De la Première Period Intermediate et de la looks like the ninth or the 11th part of me 11th dynasty biblioteca egyptica 10 Brussels 1948 so they say those two volumes are important um obviously one is talking about an intermediate period in egypt right there so you know pick those up Magical fragments of the late kingdom exist in the still unpublished Ramesseum Papyri. Others written in Dynasty in Dynasty 19 belong to the Chester Beatty Papyrus, referred to above, page 20. In two. Let's keep it going. It contains spells for the protection of mothers and their children. It was the common belief that the dead could exercise a potent influence upon the fortunes of the living for good or evil. It's the letters addressed to deceased parents and others, relatives, which have been found upon earthenware vessels deposited in the tombs. Likewise, inscribed upon pots of denunciations of various foreign chieftains and others deemed hostile to Egypt, and a fresh series of similar character has been discovered written upon actual in images of the enemies in question. And, and what this is, this will lead you like to the, to the overthrowing of a pep when you write a pep on a, uh, uh, a glass shard or some pottery, you might X them out or put stab marks on the pottery, recite the, recite the uh, prayer to him, and then you shatter the glass. 
it's almost like new year's resolutions that you destroy you know get rid of the evil so you do the same thing and obviously they were doing this as well with uh foreign chieftains and those hostiles to Kemet or Egypt at the time and if they wanted their ancestor to help them they would also do this and put whatever it was on that pot that was ailing them and destroy it and ask for help from the Aku so you know what it is this is ancient times see now you'll ask for Jesus to help you or you'll ask for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you you'll ask for the foreign god to help you because <laughs> you if you if you've seen jesus you know <laughs> and you were from egypt you would not yeah or if you're from africa it would be foreign to you but because you're in america now that's that's how you move let me find where we were just at <laughs> i jumped well ahead on accident Let me get back to that place. So you're talking ancient Africa right now. As I pull up to the spot. And what they would do. And who they would ask. And how they would ask. Let me play Sean Hole for a brief moment. Give me just a moment. Okay, we're back. Let me find the place we were at. Remember, when you listen to these back, after I finish the series, they'll be edited, so all these parts will be missing. Any intermissions will be missing. Let me get back to part D. Leave you on page 19. We read that. We read this. We read this. And we were here. Right there, see mothers and their children. Here we go. So, likewise, inscribed upon pots are denunciations of various foreign chieftains and others deemed hostile to Egypt. And a fresh series of similar character has been discovered written upon actual images of the enemies in question. So, 
<clears throat> like I said, that's this is old African tradition. You can still find this in New, in Nigeria with my Ifa partners, some of the Ifa priests, like uh, Ifa Batalo, uh, Okadrian. Um, it's one of my partners in Nigeria. Some of the axemen from Nigeria. Some of my buddies. A lot of the cats in Ghana. You can even find some of the Muslims who, you know, switch religion to be Muslim, you know, due to war or whatever the case, they still practice the, the, the ancient ways. It doesn't leave. So they'll write a spell. I got a matter of fact, I, I got a I got a leopard skin pouch from my partner Ahmed, which he put a spell in, an Islamic spell in. Of protection to protect me when we were at war. It's sitting right over here. I think I could, let me see if I could find it. I'll pull it up and show it to you. <laughs> at, no, it's in the car, actually. It's right in the car. So the old ways, they stay with you. They stay with you. They're better. Let's keep going. Fourteen secular non-literary documents out of the practice of magic arose the science of medicine. Some important medical papyri have survived. The oldest pages dating from the end of Dynasty 12 were found at Elahun, wrongly known as Kahun, and deal with gynecological cases. From the same place came fragments of a veterinary papyrus. Far surpassing these in both size and interest are two magnificent manuscripts written at the beginning of Dynasty 18. The Ebers Papyrus gives instruction in the treatment of many maladies besides describing the heart's action and explaining various medical terms. The Edwin Smith Papyrus is mainly concerned with wounds, but adds on the verso a number of magical and medical prescriptions of sundry kinds. Later than these is a well-preserved papyrus showing marked affinity to the Ebers to be assigned to the 19th and 20th dynasty are several other manuscripts of which the archetypes were certainly many centuries earlier. This class of composition presents serious difficulties owing to the technical nature of its subject matter. Further obstacles to comprehension are the main, many unidentified names of drugs and diseases not to speak of the probability of textual corruptions. Let's take a look at our notes here. We got Earman. And, and you can get that book. That's in German. Alan H. Gardner, K. Seth, Egyptian Letters to the Dead, London, Egypt Exploration Society. I recommend that book. So you can see, you can see what the ancestors wrote. You can see what their thinking was. You can see how they venerated their elders. Kesef. Convenient editions of the main text by W. Rezinski. General characterization C.H. Grappa. Right. Griffith Hieratic Papyri from Cajon and Gorab. Unpublished Ramesseum Papyri. Uh, Dynasty 13 contains fragments of three more medical texts, only one of which, however, shows any degree of completeness. Papyrus Ebers. And I'm sure so, several of you have either the Ebers Papyrus, the Edwin Smith Surgical Papyrus, the Hearst Medical Papyrus, uh, any of these Hearst Medical papyr Papyruses. You probably see me debate and pull them out. If you've been watching this channel for a while, I think it was a couple thousand of you that watched the one debate I had toward a young and down. <laughs> Just letting them know, like, don't disrespect the ancestors. This is ancestor watch over here. Let's keep going. Make sure you write those books down. That's why I take time with the screen so you guys can see that stuff. Here we go. Secular, non-literary documents. Several works on mathematics have been found. The two most important are the Rhine Papyrus in the British Museum and another in the Moscow Collection. The problems dealt with 
are all a purely practical order, but in some cases involve a considerable degree of knowledge. A lexicographical book emanating from the already mentioned Ramesseum find contained lists of birds, animals, cereals, parts of an ox, geographical names, and the like, but the earlier portions are very fragmentary. The legal documents which have been preserved are less numerous than one might have expected. Some wills were discovered among the Illahun papyri as well as deeds of sale, census list, etc. From the neighboring site of Medinet Gurab come several agreements concerning the work of certain female slaves together with the process process verbal of a lawsuit connected with the same subject. So back in the day, they're doing lawsuits at ancient times. They're doing lawsuits. If, you, if you've ever read um, Anxious Shank, you'll see they have interest. They got stock market type stuff going on. He talk about put interest, take out a loan, put interest on it for your birthday, and it'll multiply and then he says a few things after it. So this is happening in ancient times. So you see how the, the, the world you live in now, today, is influenced by what was done then. A more obscure document in which a female slave plays a prominent part is interesting for its legal form and terminology. Agreeing with those of a highly important stele discovered at Karnak more than 20 years ago, but unfortunately still unpublished. This records this records the cell of the office of a mayor at El Cobb under the obscure king of dynasty 17. The only other process verbal of a lawsuit failing within our period dates from the reign of Jehudimus IV and it's very fragmentary <clears throat> pardon me a long inscription in a tomb at Asyut early dynasty 12 records the arrangements made with the local priesthood for periodic funerary offerings to be made on behalf of the tomb owner after his death the text being set forth in a number of paragraphs well illustrating the character given to written contracts at this period of high importance for our knowledge of the administration of Egypt are a long inscription of Dynasty 18, setting forth the duties of the vizier and com complementary text recording the advice given to the vizier on the occasion of his appointment by the pharaoh. Earlier than the phase of the language covered by this book are the royal decrees dating from the Old Kingdom, conferring upon the staffs of various temples immunity from external interference. Let's read the footnotes. You can see we're almost done with this section today. T.E.P. The Rhine Mathematical Papyrus, London. A.B. Chase, The Rhine Mathematical Papyrus, two volumes, Oberlin, Ohio. W.W. Struve, Mathematischer Papyrus des Stockland Museums der Schonen Kunste in Moscow. So it's in Moscow. They say Berlin, 1930s, when it's published. So, C2, Ancient Egypt, 1917, 100 through 2, JEA, 15. Fragments, similar treaties, Griffith. Alan H. Garner, Ancient Egyptian Onomastica, three volumes. Ramesseum Onomastica. Smither, report concerning the slave girl Sinbet. What's her name? You can find that in the JEA. What's that? Journal of Egyptian Archaeology. Y'all remember what that looks like, right? Here go one of them right here. There's the other one. There they go. The J E A. Find a lot of them right here. Right there. In case you don't have. In case you never know. All right, let's get back to it. Anytime you see this JEA, that's what they're talking about. Those particular volumes I just showed you are what they refer to. It's that same mirror. Tomb of Rekmi Ra at Thebes, two volumes, New York, Metropolitan Museum, the text volume two. See, translation volume one, pages 88 through 94. All that stuff. 26 through 8. 
119 through 22. Volume 2, all that. So make sure you get those. Make sure you write those down. You know how to find them. I'm making this easy for you all. So let's continue where, where we were at. Dispatches passing between the capital and certain officials stationed in the fortress of the second cataract throw light on sides of Egyptian official life not illustrated elsewhere. Many fragments of account books and the like have been found. The most interesting being a journal detailing the distributions of food made at the court of the king Sebekhotep of dynasty 13. The records of a royal dockyard at the time of Jehudi Mr. III and some apparently related accounts on two papyrus at Leningrad and on two others in Lovre. A large number of private letters exist, some dating back as far as Dynasty VI. So this is why I say when they when they tell us stuff like the people couldn't write or read, you got writing as old as Dynasty VI. So by the 20th dynasty, nobody figured this out, how to read or write, other than the nobles. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Anyway, let's keep going. The finest of all, still unpublished, were discovered by H. Wenlock in Dynasty 11. Two met thieves and deal with the agricultural and domestic interests of one Hecken, Hecken Naket. There you go, right there. Hecken not kept and various associates and relatives of his many more come from Ilahun and belong to the second half of dynasty 12 curiously few letters letters of dynasty 18 have come to hand but a series of six all centering around the person of a scribe named Amos well illustrate the epi epistolary style of the period Turning now to historical records of one kind and another, the earliest of these are the private autobiographies from the tombs and the royal decrees just mentioned. Of great interest also are the inscriptions left by the leaders of expeditions to distant mines or quarries, such as those of Sinai and Wadi Hamamat. It is not until the end of Dynasty 12 that official monu monuments with historical texts really, let's read now, begin among the oldest of some boundary stones erected by Sesosteros III at Simna in the second cataract. We'll get to that in a second. Let's go to our footnotes. On the so-called Versal Papyrus Leningrad, 1116 A and B in the publication cited below, 24A. They're talking about this publication, Papyrus Lovre, published in H. Bruggish, Source inscription Egypticum Leipzig. So consecutive accounts as yet. Bulletin of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Egyptian Expedition. Griffith Hieratic Papyri from Kahun and Goram. From later finds Asharaf Reefs, Os Elahun, and Zeitskrafford, whatever. <laughs> Those in the Lovre, edited by TEP, Journal of Egyptian Archaeology. Those in the British Museum, S. Glanville, J.E.A. I'll open one of these one time and we'll go see if it's on that page. To, we'll just go find out, right? I thought, let me see if I, matter of fact, just for the sake of reference, I'm going to look. Let's see if I, if I have volume 14, we'll go to 294. If I have volume 12, we'll go to 7. Let me see which one we got. Let's see. Just so we can see if, if if what they say is right, right? They go volume 14. And let's see what they said again. Let's go here first. JEA 14, 294 through 312. There's this is footnote nine. Let's check. Curiously, few letters of Dynasty 18 have come to hand, but a series of six, all centering around the person of a scribe named Amos, well illustrate the epistolatory style of the period. I believe this is going to be right because I just read a letter from Amos from out of one of these, right? I think it said 294. 
Alexander Shraff's name right there. Um, so we know it's on point. Let me see what page it was again. <laughs> this is so you know how to use your tools. JEA 14. So we're in volume 14, page 294 through 312. Let's see. back of the book almost I'm gonna blow this up for you guys once I get to the page oh they go to Ptolemaic papyri here we go. letters of Amos to Peniati see let's blow it up let's blow it up I would mess it up, wouldn't I? <laughs> Let's go to 295. Let's come back more, right? I messed it up. Too far. I don't want too far. Let's go like this. Let's get them up. Let me, let me, let me break this back down some so we can get back to our page real quick. Leave it to me, I'll mess it up. I will tear it up. 241. See, we were doing good and then I messed that up right there. So. Okay, 280. We're just going to go the old fashioned way. We're going to flip some pages. Here we go. We're blowing them up. This time, let me grab the right one, right? Let's make it bigger. All right, here we go. British Museum Papyrus numbers 10,000, 102, 103, 104, and 107 contain four letters or parts of letters written at a period of which we have very few epistolary remains. So they're using the same wording. Everything is you know, we just read that same information in Sir Alan Gardner. And this is by SRK Glanville. So we can check his footnotes and check the source. Talking about almost described as Peniati. And we're still not at the source, right? We're still just reading what the excavators did this is an archaeological book and we've got a full table so we know what they found from Mentahotep, Hori, Amos, Petahu, Teti, and Amos. Writer's title or description, Hatia, Peniati, right? Amos, Amos, Wazrin put or something like that. I can't see what this letter is right here. So we got it. Right? We this is how you use the footnote and how you use the work. And we're still not see we're, we're still not at the primary yet though. There goes the here we go. Now we have what can be described as a picture very bad picture of a primary and it's still readable I bed right Shemu, all that stuff Ra Hori so we know the day Neferi right Er Abed all right so you know Her, uh, 
right? We know. I can read it all real fast. We're not going to. The tab on it, but we're not to. All that effort. So, I just want you to see how this works. You got a footnote from Gardner right here. You got a statement from Gardner above. We got a footnote from Gardner below showing where he got it from. And we got the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology right here with a picture of a primary resource. All that happened right there for us. They go another primary. Picture of a primary, right? Not even a clear picture, but a picture. So we know they were there. We got it. And there's a couple more primaries. Just in case we need to check and ask or read it ourselves, it's, it's well enough in some cases where we can make out most of what is saying. Letters. Okay, so that's how that would work. Anyway, stretching it out. <laughs> and don't even need to. So these are footnotes here. J-E-A, anytime you know how to use that, where to find the map. Just about all of them. There's other stuff. Make sure you, like I said, make sure you saw all this. So make sure you get all the books from this. PDF them. Let's keep going. So we can finish out. So we read that, begin among the oldest of some boundary stones erected by Sesostros III at Simnah in the Second Cataract. In Dynasty 18, such monuments become frequent. They record either warlike campaigns or the dedication of great buildings to the gods. Particularly valuable are the many texts of the kind which Jehudimus III caused to be placed in the Temple of Karnak. The literature of the early periods. Let's check that out. Several stories have been preserved. Hold on one second. All right, and we're back. Phone is ringing like crazy with that. All right, literature of the early period. Several stories have been preserved to us from the Middle Kingdom. The masterpiece is the tale of Sinaway, an official at the court of Amenes I, who, overhearing the news of the murder of that king, fled away in panic to Palestine. There he rose to a position of great influence, but in old age was overcome by longing for his Egyptian home. His pardon and return to the royal palace are recounted with great vivacity and humor. Vivacity and humor, pardon me. Another book tells how a peasant of the Wadi Natron, the oasis nearest to Egypt, is robbed of his asses whilst on his way to that land. He complains to the high steward of the king, and with such eloquence that the high steward is ordered to detain him and to make him talk. In the end, the peasants' petitions are reported to the king and the wrong inflicted is made good. This is uh, the eloquent peasant that you, you guys always hear Smash read this story. He loves that story. Um, the romance of travel finds expression for the first time in the story of a shipwrecked sailor who was cast upon a wonderful island where a kindly serpent holds sway. 
a more popular character is an unfortunately mutilated book of tales relating wonderful events which happened in the reigns of the pharaohs to Joseph, Nebka, Snafu, and Cheops. The last tale of the four contains a legend of the origin of the fifth dynasty. A fragment seems to deal with the fortunes of a cowherd who has tempted in the marshes by a goddess in a human shape. And there are the didactic treaties containing wise maxims and proverbial truths were greatly to the taste of the Egyptians. The earliest complete example of such a Soviet or instruction is inscribed to the vizier Patahatep who lived under Asosi of the fifth dynasty. Let's finish the sentence. It contains a vice, much of it unfortunately obscure, which might serve his son in his, in his administrative career. Let's go back up and read our footnotes. We've got Earman, the literature of the ancient Egyptians, translated by A.M. Blackman, London. The Febric, Romans, Et Contes, Egyptian, Paris. Most of the texts mentioned below are translated in one or both of these important books so that no further references to them will be given. Three stories have been translated also by B. Gunn and B. Lewis, Land of Enchanters. Uh, A. H. Gardner. The text also in A. M. Black Middle Egyptian Stories, Part 1. F. Vogel sang in A. H. Gardner, Die Klagen des Baring Leipzig. There's a few books right there, Volume 6. W. Glanischef, Les Papyrus Hieratics. 115, 116A, 116B. Imperial A. St. Petersburg, Transcription, Translation, and Notes by Ehrman, Zeitschrift for Egyptus, Sprach, 1 through 26, the text, also with W. Golenscheif, El Comte du Nogfrag, Cairo, same place, Institute France of Archaeology Oriental, that's their Oriental Institute in France, basically. And again, in Ermin, the Martian des Papyrus West Car. This is uh, a different Oriental Institute that looks like it's in Germany. With the Hyogen, Austin, Orientalishan, Samlujan, and I can't say that properly. <laughs> St. Papyrus preserves the remains of similar councils addressed by a vizier of the Third Dynasty to his children, of whom one named Kagemni followed him in his high office, a book that enjoyed immense popularity in the schools, but which has come down to us only in a late and impossibly corrupt version, is the instruction of Akhtor, the son of Duauf. Here, the various trades and professions are reviewed, and the conclusion is drawn that the occupation of scribe only confers dignity and staves off misery. Two kings left, instructions as a legacy of their successors. No book was more admired than the instruction of Amenemis, Am Amenemis the first, the literary testament of a pharaoh of a great achievements who appears in a dream to his successor, Sestosteros the first and recounts the story of his assassination and of the ingratitude with which his favors have been rewarded. No less interest is the advice given to his son and heir, Mary Kara, by a ninth dynasty king whose name is lost. Here much stress is laid on piety and, and reference is made to various historical events. The actual authorship of the various works above mentioned is of course open to doubt. The more so since the Egyptians' love of ancient attributions is amply attested in the medical writings of the Book of Coming Forth by the other Book of the Dead. A related group of texts is best described under the name pessimistic literature. So now this is the pessimistic literature. Remember, each one of these in bold black, you want to write down. And then you want to have a summary of what kind of literature they are so you can understand the difference between the types of literature you find in ancient Egypt when you read it. This kind of literature seems to have sprung up under the influence of the catastrophes which overwhelmed Egypt at the close of the sixth dynasty 
bringing in their trained centuries of social upheaval and political disruption. The keynote is once sounded by the conservatives and aristocrats of all ages. Wickedness and misery are everywhere rife, and the poor have usurped the place of the rich. Such a book of laments is that of the prophet Ippuware, who nonetheless seems able to display the dawning of a happier day. Another prophetic book predicts the coming of a king, Ameni, Amenus I, the founder of Dynasty 12. The supposed speaker is a sage of the time, Sunafu, Dynasty of uh, Four, named Neferu, 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 One Ka Kepera, Sen B a priest of Heliopolis is yet another critic of his own age who naively voices his desire for originally for original phraseology and new expressions wherewith to unburden some of these names are difficult the way they spell them in metal nature we some of this stuff would not be pronounced as such so when he puts ka kepara sun sun b that's a little difficult to say the way he's got that written. So some of the English writings of the Egyptian names may need to be redone. Let's finish that sentence though. His troubled heart. There it is, it's finished. <laughs> Let's go to the footnotes. We'll get to that right after the, the other sentences. So on the footnotes, and you'll notice something from Sir Alan Gardner, which which is a commendable one and also smart. He's always taking you to the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology. He'll use the author's book and then he'll take you back to the archaeological product. Why? Because the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology has what? The primary resource. If you have the primary resource, you've got the original. There's no need to guess. We just need to figure out what it says or what it looks like or how it happened, etc., etc. So he's smart with that to always lead the trail back to the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology, which he does. So he's got Jochele, Papyrus, Prissy, Edses, Variantes, some variations of the Prissy Papyrus, basically. Uh, E. Deval, Les Maxims, Pataha Tep, that's the Maxims of Pataha Tep, as if you didn't know. Um, transcription and translation by A. H. Gardner, J. E. A. H. Bruner, D. Lechre, Des Chete, Sonnes, Des Duaf, that's the, 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 the brother Duaf right there that they was talking about above the scribe. Uh, Egyptologist Forschungen. by Alexander Sharp. I'm not sure what this is. I don't know if they're trying to say Horus. I don't. I don't know what that is in German. Gustav Hamburg. But you can always, like I said, type the text in. So you pull up the book. Minhet the first, Sinasra the first, same place, Oriental Institute out there in France. It's another one, Zui, Al Egypt, politics in Egyptian, Shrifen, Analytica, Egyptica, basically. Copenhagen, 1945. Begun in the JEA, also translated by Alan H. Gardner. That's another smart reason why it's important that he uses the JEA. He's doing most of the translations. <laughs> so he's backing himself up. The Admonitions of an Egyptian Sage. We've all seen that book, etc. Let's keep going. Oh, not too far, huh? A composition of a very unusual type is the dialogue between a man weary of life and his own soul. And everybody knows this story where the guy talks about committing suicide and uh, 
different parts of his soul and body talk to him, his car, his bar, they talk to him. In stanzas of considerable beauty, the man describes his disgust at the world he lives in and his longing for death, but he is haunted by the fear lest in seeking a voluntary death, he may be deserted by his soul. The arguments on both sides are full of obscurity, but the soul appears to give way in the end, won over by the man's plea that the dead have power, like gods, to chastise the evil of the world they have won. Uh, secular poetry. There's little remains of it at that time, so there's even probably smaller remains of it at this time. Some hymns to Sesosterus III well illustrate the use of, of the refrain and the penchant felt by the Egyptian writers for a rhythmical parallelism of members. Music and song were the regular accompaniment of every banquet, but the legends written besides the figures sculptured on the tomb walls seldom give more than the opening words. In the tomb of Neferhotep at Thebes, let me scoop this up. A harper urges his listeners to eat, drink, and be merry, for death is the common lot, and none may tell what lies beyond. On the opposite wall, such cynicism is sternly rebuked. Is not the Western universal home, where all may find rest and where wrangling is no more? The 19th dynasty has bequeathed to us some tender little love songs. Of these, a few may well belong to the Middle Kingdom. To sum up what has survived to us, from the literature of early Egypt is but a small selection of fortuitous samples. We are fortunate enough to possess a few of those writings by which the Egyptians themselves lay most store. But the study of other books of which we have but single copies and which may therefore be conjectured to have enjoyed less celebrity shows that the ancient tastes differ considerably from our own and that possibly many works in which we could find real poetic beauty have been lost through lack of appreciation at the time they were written. The best characteristics of Egyptian literary art are in its directness, its love of the picturesque, and its sense of humor. The worst effects are a leaning towards bombast, a monotony in the metaphors used, and a very limited range of sentiment. The impression with which we are left is that of a pleasure-loving people, happy, yay they say, artistic and sharp-witted, but lacking in depth of feeling and idealism. Of course, they'll say that about you. You're African. <laughs> lacking in death. Nothing about this culture lacks in death or idealism. <laughs> in fact, they created the ideas for the future, as you can see. We've already, and we've already kind of covered and read in some of the descriptions of the work. But let's read our footnotes. British Museum published admonitions of the sage. Yeah, A. Ehrman. Stella that he read some other works to so make sure you pick these up I read a papyri from Cajun and Gorub right Merriam Lichtan Songs of the Harbor the Journal of the Near Eastern Studies Praise of Death and the Proceedings of the Society Society of Biblical Archaeology Important new examples in A.H. Gardner, the Chester B. Papyrus. Let's keep going. Now, we're done. So the next time we do a reading, now that we're past the introduction, <laughs> we're going to get into some of these. And when we go here, like into some of these, like when we're talking about a particular person, we're going to visit the tomb. Next time is lesson one, obviously, right? We're going to cover the writing direction. And we'll start to write. And I'll probably pull out some pen and paper and write some of the metal that you're down. But when I say we're going to go visit some of these tombs, like this says, funerary wishes from the tomb of Amen Emhet, right? We're going to go right to the tomb. And we're going to find that person's tomb. Oh, there he goes right there. So this is Amin Imhat. I had a bunch of pictures that got stolen, unfortunately. But that's okay, because I'll be going back to YouTube shortly. But in his tomb, we can see him. 
and his girl, Raquel. And we can start to pull this stuff up, right? And if we know what we're talking about, we know what we're talking about. We can read right there. Sign that bet, right? We can read it right there. That bet per Lord's house. Hemet. Hemet F, right? Men F. The, all of that stuff. All we we should be able to read it, right? We're right here. <laughs> we can see him right here. You can see his girl right there. Nipple and all. What's he got in his hand? Oh, that's the figure S, huh? Hmm. So we can see we can see everything going on with the people right on the spot. And the children on them. See its location. Tiles on the wall, everything. And we can do this with, with most with, with with a good number of them. Not all of them, but a good number of them. Right? So you can see the brother with his afro, you can see his click. Him sitting in the chair, basically. That's him sitting in the chair. So you don't have to guess. No guesswork. You're just going right to the source. And that's what will make this talk interesting. Because we make it interactive. Even though I have long periods where I got to go do something. Right? <laughs> there go the brother right here. There you go right there. There they go playing the harp. Doing the damn thing. You can see the color is lost on some of these. You can see she's darker. You can see they took some of it off. Down to her. She's probably the same color as him. They'll call her yellow now. Right here, they talk. See, she's white in color. As if you don't see this here. And it's been pulled off. As if her dress wasn't the white portion. So, yeah. You, you, you know what's going on. And you can see the stuff right here. See everything going on. Hit tap ek and hit tap ka ka ek all that stuff, man. Emmy, all that stuff. <laughs> so that's some of the fun we'll be able to have with that. And we pulled him up. Why? Why did we pull this brother up? I'm in him hot because they're talking about the tomb of Amenem Hat right here. And we're going directly to it. So you don't have to guess. You don't have to make a reach. With that said, that'll conclude today. When we start up, we'll probably, I'll probably start up tomorrow. We're going to cover the directions. Writing and lesson one. Let's see what else is in here. Phonograms, sound signs. Sound signs? I probably couldn't pronounce it. Sound signs. Um, Uniliterals. Biliterals. Triliterals. The alphabet. Transliteration. We go that alphabet. Semi vowels and weak consonants. Absence of the article. Until we get to lesson two. Pen and pencil. Let me check. All right, we straight. So, with that said, Dua for listening. Dua Shadi. Uncle Jed, Uncle Jasaneb. Remember who you are and being a star. Imitate.